Good morning. Thank you, Asha, Kennedy, and Kung for joining class this morning. Uh, can I ask Kung to lead us in prayer, please, before we begin? It's positive. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this um, morning. Uh, God, I pray that uh, as we hear your word, God, that we would pay attention to it and that uh, we would uh, mm, apply it, God, in our uh, daily life, God. Uh, Lord, we thank you for uh, helping us to, um, to uh, teach well, God. Thank you, Lord, that you would just bless her and that uh, you would guide her. Lord, um, we thank you for this time. We love you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kung. Okay, we're just three of you, but uh, I think we just have to begin with Siddhant. Siddhant does not come to Bible College today. He's here, Pastor. Okay, I haven't seen him join class. Anyways, okay. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning, Asha. Good morning. Okay, so we were looking at Romans chapter. 11 uh, on Wednesday we began Romans 11 uh, where Paul says you know uh, ask a question uh, in verse 1 has God cast away his people uh, you know we know that Paul is uh, you know has following this pattern of asking questions rhetorical questions so he says has God uh, cast away his people the Jews uh, because now he's chosen the church, uh, the chosen church has his chosen people. So he says, certainly not. Look at me. I'm an example that he has chosen me. And uh, Paul says that those who, uh, you know, uh, yes, you know, there are people who, uh, the Jews who have rejected the gospel, they have not believed, they have not accepted, and they have rejected the gospel. But there are a remnant Jews, there are, uh, Jews who have received salvation by grace through faith uh, and they are now part of the kingdom of God uh, so there is a remnant that is uh, there and then he goes on to talk about how the rejection because the Jews rejected uh, the truth of the gospel the truth is now taken uh, to the uh, Gentiles and uh, you know by taking the truth to the Gentiles somehow you know uh, God wants to provoke uh, the Jews uh, to jealousy so that you know they can come to faith in Christ Jesus they can uh, be saved by also taking um, uh, the uh, the you know the truth of the gospel to the Gentiles you know God uh, wants to awaken so-called awaken uh, the Jews from their sleep from their slumber so that they can see the truth uh, the light that is in the gospel of uh, Jesus Christ and they will accept him as their Lord and Savior and then he goes to very beautifully uh, talk about um, you know, in, in, in verses uh, 16 onwards, he talks about, uh, uh, you know, the cultivated olive tree, which is uh, which resembles uh, the Jewish nation, the Jewish race, uh, the Israelites. And then he talks about the wild olive tree that resembles the Gentiles. And he says some of the branches of the, uh, of the, uh, of the cultivated olive tree has been broken because these are the branches that have not uh, 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 accepted or believed in the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, in that place, you know, uh, the, the, the branches of the wild olive tree have been grafted, which means the Gentiles have been incorporated into the plan purposes uh, of God, into the kingdom of God. Um, and these Gentiles uh, are those who have... Uh, uh, received salvation by grace uh, through faith and so they have been grafted into the tree of life and Paul says you know don't uh, tell telling the Gentiles don't be um, uh, uh, you know uh, proud uh, that you are part of the you know of the uh, uh, of this tree because you know you know, you need to know that the roots, the roots are basically talking, the roots are the Jewish nation, the Jewish race. Uh, basically, the roots are the patriarchs uh, who God gave the promises to Abraham, Isaac, uh, and to Jacob, and Moses, and uh, David, uh, and to Jesus Christ. So it says the roots, you know, the uh, are still the Jewish nation. And he says, for a while, God has, uh, you know, blind, left them, left the Jews to be blinded in their eyes, 
uh, to the gospel, but in the fullness of time, you know, he will bring them also back uh, into the kingdom. They will be grafted back into the uh, tree of life. And uh, Paul says, just imagine uh, Gentiles, you know, if uh, the because of the Jews, because of their rejection, you have received, uh, you know, um, uh, riches, you have received this blessing. Just imagine if uh, what would happen or the blessings that you would receive if uh, the, the Jews accept uh, the gospel, if they are saved, if they receive uh, salvation, what greater blessing uh, will you uh, incur or will you receive if just the Jews um, you know, uh, uh, come into salvation. Just their rejection, just their, uh, you know, hard, hard hardness of heart, their stubbornness has cost you so much of, uh, brought about so much of riches and blessings. Just imagine what would happen if they accept uh, the depth of the riches and the blessings that you would receive if the Jewish uh, race, the Jewish people uh, accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior or receive uh, salvation. So that was uh, Romans chapter 11 verses 1 to 25 which we looked at on, on Wednesday. We will continue. Uh, so can somebody please read verses 26 to 36 please? Verses 26 to 36 of Romans chapter 11. Yes, please. Thank you. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away godliness from Jacob, ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them, when I take away their sins. Considering the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. By considering the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, for as you were once disobedient to God, yet have not obtained mercy through their disobedience. Even so, this also have not been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, that also means obtain mercy for god has committed them all to the disobedience that he might have mercy in all all the depths of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of god how unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out for who has known the mind of the lord or who has become his counselor or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him for of him and through him and to him are all things and to him be glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Asha. So Paul brings this whole section to a conclusion. So he says, uh, uh, all Israel will be saved. It does not mean that every individual in Israel or the Jewish race will be saved. It basically means that, you know, those who receive uh, salvation, uh, salvation will touch everyone powerfully, but those who believe uh, will receive uh, salvation. So that does not mean this automatically everyone, the Jewish race will be saved, all Israel will be saved. It only means all will be saved who receive uh, and believe uh, in Jesus Christ. They will receive salvation by grace through um, faith. And then, you know, uh, uh, Apostle Paul quotes here uh, from Isaiah chapter 59 verses 20 and 21 uh, in Isaiah chapter 59 verses 20 and 21 it says the Redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob says the Lord verse 21 as for me says the Lord this is my covenant with them my spirit who is upon you and my words which I put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. So Paul is basically quoting from uh, Isaiah chapter 59, verses uh, 20 and uh, 21, that the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away these people's ungodliness. Um, and God says, this is my covenant, you know, I will take away their sins and they will turn away from their sins. They will accept uh, me. And verse 28, you know, Paul is telling the Gentiles right now, as far as the gospel is concerned, you know, the Jews are your enemies because they have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. They might be persecuting you. They might, uh, uh, you know, might doing things to harm you. So they might be considered as your enemies, but considering 
uh, God's choosing, they are the beloved of God. And who are the beloved of God? Why is he saying they are the beloved of God? It's for no other reason than for the sake of the fathers, sake of the patriarchs of the Old Testament. And that's why he's saying that they are the beloved of the Lord. So as far as God's purpose, election, calling, and choosing is concerned, you know, um, uh, the patriarchs are the roots you know, of this cultivated olive tree. They are the main cultivated uh, tree, olive tree through which God is working out his plan and his uh, purpose. And then this beautiful verse in, um, uh, you know, verse 29 says, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, which means that, you know, uh, God is not changing his mind. He does not change his uh, mind like, uh, you know, Paul starts off this whole chapter uh, by saying, has God cast away his people? That means has God cast away uh, the Jews uh, who he has given the laws, the covenants, the promises, the, uh, you know, uh, there's where the, uh, the priests has God cast them away. So he, he's saying here in verse 29, he's coming back to that and saying, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. That means God does not change his mind regarding his calling, his gifting, his choosing and purpose. So when God calls someone, you know, he does not change his mind. And this also applies to us in our present day. You know, when God has called you or called me and has chosen us, he is not going to change his mind. He is not going to cast us off. He is not going to abandon us, but he is going to work out his purposes in our life. And this is uh, the wonderful assurance that we receive that the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And then Paul, Apostle Paul sums up by saying in verses um, uh, he says that you were once disobedient to God. So he says, you Gentile Christians, uh, you also were disobedient to God. You came from disobedience, yet God uh, showed their mercy in part through the disobedience of Israel. So he says that you have received this mercy. Sorry, I lost the uh, network connection and I'm back. Okay, so uh, we're looking at verses 30, 31, and 32. And If God used the disobedience of Israel for the good of Gentiles, you know, the Jews refused to uh, accept the truth uh, that is in Jesus Christ. Now the truth is taken to the Gentiles. If God could use the disobedience of Israel for the good of the Gentiles, he could also use the mercy that he has shown to the Gentiles uh, to reach out to Israel. So that's basically saying that, you know, obtain mercy to their disobedience. The Gentiles obtained mercy because of the disobedience of the, of the Jews. And uh, so he's saying that if Gentiles, uh, you know, to bring about mercy for, to the Israelites, which means God is saying that, you know, when the gospel was taken to the Gentiles, uh, it, you know, God was using it one way so as to provoke uh, the Jews of, uh, of their jealousy so that they can receive salvation and also to wake them up from their slumber so that, uh, you know, they can uh, know the truth and they can receive the truth and believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Yes, Mangi, you have a question? Thank you, Pastor. Uh, just to, to, to feel help on clarifying the uh, disobedience of uh, of Jews, because we read we read that the gospel uh, is for everyone, and Jesus died died on the cross for everyone. And even if the Jews didn't uh, um, 
refused the cross, the gospel slept. I mean, uh, gone to the world in, in, in any way. So can you please uh, help clarify that, what Paul yes. says there? Thank yes, you. what you're saying is uh, right. Uh, but, you know, um, now, you know, there was a, there's a struggle in the, in the church, uh, and basically Paul is writing to the church at Rome. So the Jews were basically saying, you know, telling the Gentiles who become Christians that, you know, hey, you guys, uh, He's saying it's not about the law, it's not about circumcision, uh, but he's saying that you know, three, four, five, six, you know, about Abraham, how he was justified by uh, faith. So, um, keep these Old Testament rituals and laws. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, Master. Okay. I know the in-between when, you know, it kind of uh, 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 reboots, I just stop and then I continue from where I uh, stopped. Okay, so then he's telling the Gentiles, you've come by faith, so don't be proud that, you know, uh, uh, you are greater than the Jews, uh, you are not, it's uh, also because you are shown mercy just like, you know, you know, because of their disobedience, uh, you know, you have the salvation, uh, the truth has been revealed to the Gentiles. Now, having said that, Paul is not trying to say that it was not God's plan at all uh, to reach out to the other nations. Okay, uh, if you look at the very uh, plan of God in the Old Testament, we see that why did he choose uh, one nation? It was not to show partiality to one nation. Why did he choose one race or one nation? Is so that through them, the surrounding nations can know uh, the true and living God. They can know the laws. They can know the rituals. They can know the commandments. They can uh, know everything. So... God wants the Israelites to keep uh, the laws, to keep, to worship Him, um, and also to, uh, by doing so, to be an example to the surrounding uh, nations. And uh, when the surrounding nations, uh, you know, uh, were punished for their disobedience, for their violence, uh, for their acts of, uh, you know, of uh, of uh, disobedience against God, you know, uh, God used. Uh, 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 the Jewish race to, you know, uh, uh, to correct them, uh, to show them his mercy and love. And through, so through his mercy and love, he wanted the other nations also to, uh, you know, uh, to come uh, uh, to know him as God and to worship him. Just like Jonah, you know, he could have, uh, uh, God could have wiped out the entire city of Nineveh because uh, they, were, uh, they were very, very wicked people. Uh, uh, the people of Nineveh were extremely wicked, but God shows mercy to them. Again, okay? he uses uh, Jonah to bring about his mercy to these people. So what we're saying is that it's not just God choosing the Jewish race, but through the Jewish race, he wants to bring about uh, his salvation or make himself known uh, to the other nations as well. So here, basically, what Paul is saying is not just because, you know, if, if the Jews would not have rejected God, if they would not have... Um, you know, if they all would have accepted God, then God would not have taken salvation or the truth to the Gentiles. No. You know, he would have used the Jews to uh, reach out to the other nations, just like he did in the Old uh, Testament. But we see that when when uh, the Jewish race, when the Israelites worshipped idols, they received the same punishment that God gave to the other nations who, you know, did not worship him. So he is not a partial God. But here is basically Paul is in his argument, he's, uh, he's saying that, you know, don't be proud, you Gentiles. You know, it's... Uh, 
you know, you receive this because of the mercy of God, just like the, the Jewish uh, race also are going to receive mercy. They're, just like God is showing you mercy, he's going to show them mercy as well. Did that help, uh, Mangi? Yes, Pastor, that's, that's helped. Thank you. Okay. And so in verse, um, you know, uh, 32, God is saying, God has committed to them all, uh, God has committed them all to disobedience. The idea is that Jews and Gentiles both are lawbreakers in God's sight, you know, uh, but God offers them mercy uh, based on the person and work of Jesus Christ. So everybody is equally, uh, you know, shown mercy. Everybody is equally having this right standing in grace when they receive salvation by grace through uh, faith. And in verses 33 to 36, Paul is celebrating uh, this mystery that, you know, is being revealed. So what is this mystery? Verse 25, we've already seen the mystery that Paul speaks about in verse 25. says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinions, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. We look at this uh, towards the end of the last class in verse 25. And Paul in verses 33 to 36 is basically celebrating this mystery that is being revealed that, you know, uh, there is a remnant of Jews who believe in Christ. There are some still many Jews who are blinded to the truth and uh, God has let them be in their blindness uh, in part till, you know, the, the gospel is being preached to the Gentiles and then he is going to come and, you know, uh, is also going to work among the Jews and those who believe in him will be saved and be part of his uh, kingdom. And then he is, how is he celebrating? How is Paul celebrating this mystery? He's celebrating uh, in verses, um, you know, in verses... Um, 33 to 36, he's praising God, he's talking about, uh, you know, how, how uh, uh, you know, how he's celebrating the depth and the riches of both the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how wonderful is God in his working, uh, you know, he's also praising God uh, because God is at work and his ways are unsearchable, his ways are beyond our understanding. Uh, and so he's just basically praising God for who he is, for his uh, mystery that is revealed, for his wisdom and knowledge that is so unsearchable, that is way beyond our uh, understanding. So what is God doing uh, to the nations is actually he's bringing all of them together into his plan and purpose, uh, which is for the Gentiles and the Jews uh, to experience the mercy of uh, God and in verses thirty four and thirty five, uh, you know, Apostle Paul quotes from the Old Testament, uh, Isaiah chapter forty verse thirteen and Job chapter fourteen forty one verse eleven. So in um, Romans chapter eleven verse thirty four, he says, "For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor?" Verse thirty five, or who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him. Uh, that is, he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 13, and Job chapter 41, verse 11. And then Paul ends this whole uh, part of his letter by saying, For him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Okay, so it's all of him. This plan came from God. It wasn't man's idea. We didn't say, well, we were offended God. We have to find a way to get back to him. Uh, so let's work on a plan to come back to God. Uh, no, it was not our plan. Uh, in our spiritual indifference uh, and death, we didn't care about a plan. And even if we did care, we were not smart enough or wise enough to make one. So it's all of him. It was him who planned. Uh, it was God's plan and purpose. Uh, it's it is all through him, which means that even if we had a plan, we couldn't make it happen. Uh, we couldn't free ourselves from the prison of sin and self. It could only happen through Christ, through God. So it's through him. And the great work of Jesus on our behalf is the, is the work that is done through him that brings salvation. And then he says, it's all to him. So in this last verse, in verse 36, it says, for of him, through him, and 
to him so it's all to him it's not for me it's not for you it's all to him so it's uh, all the praise the glory and honor goes to him because it is his grace uh, it's for his pleasure that we are created and we find fulfillment in bringing him glory uh, and bringing him honor and then he ends uh, this verse 36 by saying to him uh, be glory forever so the fact that Paul can't figure out uh, you know, God, uh, uh, figure out God or understand his ways and knowledges, uh, comprehend his ways of doing things. Uh, he says that makes it uh, all the more the reason to glorify him, to give him all the honor that he is uh, due. So when we understand some of the greatness of God, you know, uh, we can, uh, you know, worship him more. Uh, passionately. So that is how he ends, uh, you know, this part of this letter uh, of what we are looking at is chapter 11. So it says, for him and to him and to him all things, to him be the glory forever. So Paul is basically breaking out in uh, praise and glory and honor uh, because of, you know, God's plan, his way of doing things, how he is still dealing with the Jews, how he's bringing about the Gentiles, grafting them into the tree of life, bringing in them into his plans and purposes, and he's still yet going to reach out to the Jews. He's going to bring them into his, uh, uh, to bring them into salvation. He's also going to graft them into the tree of life, okay, or back into the cultivated olive tree. So that was um, Romans chapter 11. Anyone has any questions? Romans chapter 11, any questions? Questions anyone has, any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, then uh, can we move on to chapter 12? Is that okay? Yes, no? Okay, uh, we'll move on to chapter 12. Okay, now in chapter 12, actually Paul is turning back his attention to the church, uh, the believers, the church at Rome. Uh, so now he's actually connecting back to Romans chapter 8, okay? So till Romans chapter 8, uh, you know, from Romans chapter 1 to 8, in this part of his letter, he was connecting to the believers um, uh, in the church. He was writing to the believers. He was talking about how to live the Christian life. He was talking about how to walk in the spirit in chapter 8. He was talking about how to crucify the flesh, how to, uh, you know, rejoice uh, even in tribulation. And he says in chapter 8 that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, so he's connecting back from Romans 8 now into chap in chapter 12 or this part of the letter. But we see in chapters 9 to 11, he goes uh, kind of on a little excursion, so to say. And then he comes back about how to live the Christian life in chapter uh, 12. So he's, chapter 12 is basically connecting back to chapter 8. Um, and chapter 9 to 11 is like, you know, just kind of taking a detour, uh, you know, just a small little excursion. And now he's back uh, to the main idea. So we remember when we did the introduction, we said we need to have a forward look and a backward look. Uh, so now, you know, backward look, we're going back to Romans 8 and we're saying, you know, where he left off, he's connecting back in chapter 12 or this part of the letter where he's talking about the Christian uh, life okay so chapter 12 verse 1 paul writes he begins by saying i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of god that you present your body as a living sacrifice wholly acceptable to god which is your reasonable service so we see that paul is turning his attention to the brethren uh, which is not the Jewish brethren now. He's talking to the believers at Rome, uh, to both the Jews and the Gentiles that, comp that uh, comprise uh, the church at Rome. And Paul is making them a request, a very solemn request. He says, uh, you know, I beseech you therefore. And the word therefore means whatever I've told you in, verses, in, in chapters 9 to 11 or in that part of the letter, 
you know, in view of all that, you've understood God's plan, you understand the severity of God and the goodness of God, that God is good, but he's also severe. Uh, you also understood that he's a God who's compassionate, but he's also a God of truth and of justice. So in his dealing with his people, um, you know, there is a coming together of uh, the goodness of God and the severity of God. So he says, I want you to think of how God is working. Okay, how he worked with the people of his tribe. When uh, they rejected him, he gave them up to their own blindness, their own ways, and he has extended his goodness now to the Gentiles. The truth has been made known to the Gentiles now. Salvation has been made known uh, to the Gentiles. So in the light of all of this, you know, here's what I want you to do. So Paul is saying, keeping in mind the goodness and the severity of God, you know, what I want you to do or what I want you to do uh, with your heart, with a heart of compassion, uh, or with uh, with God's uh, mercies that He has given to you, He says He goes on to tell them what He wants them to uh, do. So He says, even as I'm telling you to do this, you know, I want you to do with a heart of compassion and with the mercies that God has given uh, to you. So what what does Paul want them to do? He says, present your bodies. He wants them to present their bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now we know that in Romans chapter 8, Paul talks about the body. He says how we need to keep the body under the power of the Holy Spirit. In verse 13 he of chapter 8, he says, you know, put to end uh, the sinful deeds of the body, uh, uh, and you will live. Uh, that's what he says in verse 13. And now he's continuing the same thought. Uh, um, and also in Romans chapter 8, he also mentions that, uh, you know, Jesus broke the power of sin on the cross. Uh, the Holy Spirit has worked in, in us to overcome the things of the flesh so that we can walk in the Spirit and not yield to the things of the flesh. So Paul is saying, in the view of all of this, you know, what God has done for us, what he's accomplished, his plan and purpose, um, you know, um, and how he's given us the Holy Spirit that enables us uh, to crucify the flesh, to overcome the flesh. He's saying in the view of all of this, what I've written so far, he says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. So present means, you know, make a deliberate choice, make it a willing intentional deliberate choice so he's saying willingly deliberately make it a choice to make your body as a living uh, sacrifice now the jews were very familiar with this word sacrifice because in the old testament they brought sacrifices as part of their worship uh, they brought uh, animals birds grains as part of the sacrifice uh, now Paul is saying, uh, you know, uh, don't bring your animals, your birds and your grains, but sacrifice yourself. Lay yourself on the altar. Sac sacrifice yourself. Uh, present yourself on the altar. Not uh, Don't present some animal or grain or bird, but you put your body there. Offer your uh, body. And he says, this is a one-time sacrifice. It's a living sacrifice. Uh, sorry, he says this is not a one-time sacrifice, but this is a living sacrifice, which means, why does he say it's a living sacrifice? Because our body is alive. You know, uh, we need to live in this world. We need to uh, keep ourselves alive to do what God has called us to do, uh, to fulfill his plan and his vision for our lives. So yes, our bodies are alive, so hence it's a living sacrifice. But even though our bodies are alive, yet it's being sacrificed. And hence it is a living sacrifice. So, uh, you know, uh, we are alive, we are here engaging in what God has called us to do, uh, what his purpose for us to do. But at the same time, we are offering ourselves on the altar. We are laying ourselves always on the altar. And hence, it's a permanent sacrifice, which means it's an ongoing sacrifice. It's not a one-time sacrifice. It's an ongoing sacrifice, which means that every day we are sacrificing the things of the flesh. Uh, we are, uh, you know, cutting off the things of the flesh. We're crucifying the flesh. And hence, we are making that sacrifice on a daily basis, day in and day out. Uh, every hour, every minute, you know, we're making that sacrifice, and hence it's, it's a per, it's a permanent 
sacrifice. And he says the sacrifice should be holy and acceptable to God. So how do we offer our bodies? We offer our bodies as a living sacrifice by keeping our bodies holy and acceptable means pleasing to God. So, you know, this is what we do constantly. This is what we do every day. We need to keep our bodies holy. We need to keep our bodies set apart uh, for God. And when we do, it is something pleasing to God. And then Paul connects this sacrifice, uh, which should, you know, which is not a one time thing, but which is a daily thing, an ongoing thing, a living sacrifice, uh, which should be a holy and, uh, you know, pleasing to God. He says, This is your reasonable service. You know, this sacrifice which you're making of your own bodies and laying it on the altar, you know, you're making it daily, uh, day in and day out. He's saying this is your reasonable sacrifice, which means he's saying this is your thoughtful worship. Okay, this is an act of worship. Uh, some translations, uh, you know, render this phrase as this is your intelligent form of worship or this is your rational or logical uh, you know, way of uh, worship. Now, let me uh, just, you know, just to explain this, let me give you some irrational way of worship so you can understand what I mean by saying that this is, you know, offering our bodies as a living sacrifice daily on the altar is a rational, logical, intelligent form of worship. Now, you know, let's think about it this way. Um, no, I'm not saying this in a very demeaning way, but you know, if uh, you know, I just go and keep beating my body with whips or cutting myself up and saying this is an act of worship. Uh, you know, how is beating up my body or or cutting myself up? How can it be an act of worship to God? You know, it seems irrational. It does not make uh, sense. In the same way, Paul is saying, you know, when you offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, you know, when you do this, this is your thoughtful, intelligent, uh, rational, logical uh, way of worshipping God. Okay, so uh, now to put this in, in practical ways, to look at this in practical ways, or think about this in practical ways, just imagine you're walking down the street, you know, you see a, a big billboard sign, and it has uh, images or graphics that is um, it's not something that you should uh, keep your eyes on or you could put your mind on that. Or just for example, you know, you are uh, Googling something on the net and, you know, you have these obscene pictures that come, uh, you know, uh, you can choose to, you know, look at it, uh, you know, focus your mind on it, or you can just choose to quickly you know, close your eyes or, you know, uh, you you know, focus your eyes on what you're searching or just close that window. Uh, or if you're looking at, uh, you know, you're ch shifting channels uh, or you're looking at some YouTube vid videos and you come across some uh, material or graphics that is, uh, you know, you shouldn't be watching, you shouldn't be seeing, uh, then you quickly switch it off. You don't uh, give it a second look, a second glance. You don't focus your mind on that. When you're doing that, you've actually offered your body as a thoughtful, intelligent, rational uh, worship to God. You've offered your bodies as a reasonable, holy sacrifice uh, to God. At that moment, you've offered your body as a reasonable, holy uh, sacrifice. Why? Because at that moment, you know, you could have chosen to look at it, indulge in uh, something that is unclean, but you have not, and uh, hence you've offered your body as a living sacrifice, and you have worshipped God uh, by doing what is right. So I hope you understood what Paul is basically trying to say. I've just tried to make it more uh, you know, uh, uh, applicable for us in our daily life. So every time when we're making the right choice, you know, uh, we are actually offering our bodies as a living sacrifice, uh, as holy and pleasing to God, uh, which is our uh, reasonable service, which means it's a thoughtful, intelligent, logical, rational worship to God. Okay, so you see how, you know, how we can offer our bodies as a living sacrifice every time we're making the right choice. So Paul is saying, in the view of all that you've heard, uh, of what God has done, his plan and purposes, brethren, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. And he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
uh, verse 2, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So he begins verse 2 by saying, and. and. The word and means also. So, you know, he says, you know, just like you, uh, you know, offer your bodies as a reasonable, holy uh, sacrifice to God, he says, also do this. Okay. Uh, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your uh, mind. Okay. Uh, remember, I just uh, uh, I said that you know you know Paul is trying to basically tell them you know uh, you know keep what. God has done for them all this time. He says, keeping all that in mind, this is what I want you to do. The first thing he says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God as your reasonable sacrifice. And then verse 2, he says, and, which means when translated says, also do not be confirmed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So he says, do not be conformed to this world, which means do not be conformed to the pattern in the way of your thinking, lifestyle, behavior, to the ways of the world. But he says, be transformed. Now, the word transformed is the Greek word metamorpho, okay, uh, from which we get the English word metamorphosis. And when you think of metamorphosis, which creature can you think of? Anything? Caterpillar. Yes, a caterpillar to a butterfly. Thank you. Uh, so the Greek word here, transformed, in this verse, you know, says, be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word transformed in Greek is metamorpho, uh, from which we get our English word metamorphosis, uh, which is basically, you know, you know, giving us an example of the caterpillar becoming a butterfly. You know, just a worm, a wriggly worm that is, you know, uh, you know, on the ground, on the dust, you know, it just becomes such a beautiful creature. It becomes such a colorful, beautiful uh, butterfly. So he's saying, you know, uh, undergo such a beautiful supernatural change in the way you think, live, and behave. Okay, in the light of everything that Christ has done for us, how He's given us the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit enables us, helps us uh, to you know crucify the flesh uh to put down the deeds of the flesh uh the way the holy spirit is enabling us he's saying you know uh do this as well you know be transformed with the renewing of your uh mind and this transformation is is undergoing a beautiful supernatural change in the way we think live and uh, behave and he tells us how this transformation is possible he says it's by the how is this transformation possible What does he say? How is it possible? How can we renew of mind? Yes, thank you. He says, uh, he says it's by the renewing of your mind. Thank you, Rupa. Okay, he says it's by the renewing of your mind. You know, uh, something that I like to talk about the caterpillar is, you know, when a caterpillar is going through metamorphosis or and it's that stage where it's going to become, uh, you know, go into the cocoon and become the butterfly, it actually begins eating and it's eating and it's eating, it's chewing on that leaves, it's consuming uh, leaf after leaf after leaf, it just keeps on eating and eating and eating. And when it eats, it expands. Uh, now, why does it eat so much? Because it's preparing for the change, the change that is going to take place. Uh, it disappears into that cocoon, and inside that cocoon, all the changes are taking place, and then it comes out as a beautiful metamorphosized um, uh, butterfly. Okay, so I like to compare this eating stage or this consuming stage of um, uh, of this uh, of this uh, caterpillar uh, to you and me, you know, uh, uh, you know, to consuming God's word because it says here that we transformed by the renewing of our mind or the renewing of the mind. The mind we know has to do with our mental faculties, the way we think, the way we reason. Now, uh, how do we renew our mind? Now, the best way to explain the renewing of the mind uh, is what we read in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 7 to 9. Um, Isaiah chapter 55, verses 7 uh, to 9. So can somebody read Isaiah chapter 55, verses 7, 8, 9, and verse 11, please? 
Isaiah chapter 55, verse 7, 8, 9, and verse 11. Um, Isaiah 55 verse 7 it says, Let the wicked change their ways and banish the, uh, the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God for he will forgive generously. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Was eleven cool? Yeah. Um, it is the same with my word. I sent it out, and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all the, all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I sent it. Amen. Thank you, Kung. So in verse 7, God is speaking uh, to the wicked. Uh, wicked basically means the man of this world uh, the, or the woman of this world. He says, I want you to forsake your ways and thoughts. Let go of them. Turn away from your ways and thoughts and come to me. Uh, and God says, you know, when you come to me, I will pardon you and I will uh, receive you. In verses 8 and 9, uh, God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither, neither are my ways than your uh, ways. And verse uh, 10, he says, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are God's thoughts and ways than our thoughts and our ways. So it's basic, or, uh, or uh, you know, the thoughts and ways of the wicked. So he's talking about the huge difference. God's ways and thoughts are way different from our ways and thoughts or from the ways and thoughts of the uh, wicked one. So the implication here is um, God is saying, you know, I'm going to help you to take on my ways and thoughts. Though my ways and thoughts are much higher, there's such a big difference. You know, my ways and thoughts are, you know, as, as high as the heavens are far above the earth, so are way uh, higher are my thoughts and my ways. And God is saying that, you know, uh, I'm going to help you to take on my ways and my um, thoughts. And how is this going to happen? How are we going to take on God's ways and thoughts is to a renewed mind. And in verse 11, he says, by the word of God. So if the word of God is going to help us uh, to take on the ways and the thoughts of God. So what is the renewing of the mind? Uh, it is the process here given in, the process here of renewing our mind is given here in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 7 to 9 and, and verse 11. It is giving up our ways and thoughts and taking on uh, God's ways and thoughts. So and as I take on the ways and thoughts of God, you know, I'm going to a transformation in my own thinking, in my own ways and my own thoughts. I'm no longer going to be taking on the ways of the world, like the wicked, but I'm going to begin to walk on the higher levels of the ways and thoughts of God. And how is that possible? By renewing of the mind, which means we need to train ourselves to leave the ways and thoughts we are used to and we take on the ways and thoughts of God and how is it possible through the word of God. So got right here in chapter 12, you know, Paul mentions some of the ways and thoughts of God uh, that uh, we can take on to renew our mind. He says, you know, he talks about forgiving, uh, showing love, so, you know, and he mentioned some other ways. So like the caterpillar, you know, which keeps on eating and eating and eating and chewing on those leaves, we also need to keep on eating and eating or we need to keep on consuming the word of God. And we, as we do, you know, the word of God, you know, fills our minds, our, our feelings, our emotions, our, our soul and our body. And, you know, uh, our, uh, we are renewed in our mind. We are renewed in our ways and thoughts. And, um, you know, God's word renews us and, you know, we become new and different. We become transformed. We become those so-called metamorphosized, uh, you know, uh, butterflies. But we need to begin to align our thoughts 
and our ways to the thoughts and ways of God. And this process of renewing our thoughts and our ways, the thoughts and ways of God is the renewing of the mind. And the renewing of the mind results in the transformation of our lives when we are able to, you know, think and live and behave um, differently. Okay. Uh, we'll stop here. We'll continue with, um, uh, with about renewing of the mind. We have more on this in uh, the next class on Wednesday. Anyone has any questions? On this, so basically how do we renew our minds is, uh, you know, the, the idea is, the answer is in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 7 and 9, the best way to explain is leaving away our ways and thoughts and taking on the higher ways and thoughts of God. And we'll see practically how we can do that next week. I'll just give you a couple of examples, which Paul again mentions in chapter 12. Any questions, please? Okay, or when do you want to have the next assessment before we call it a day before we end our class? I, I, I requested if we can have assessment two on Romans chapter five to chapter eight. Five six seven eight on October the twenty fifth. Uh, what do you all say quickly? Okay, yes, ma'am. Okay, okay ma'am. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Rupa. Yes, Sasha. Pastor, can I have some more time on the assignments? You want some more time, dear? Yes, please. Like two days or what's the next Two days, okay. I think Abhishek or somebody said that we could have it on a Thursday. I I remember seeing that, but uh, yeah, uh, actually, I yes uh, on Monday, Monday to uh, Wednesday, like one Monday full day time. If you give, oh, uh, you mean you want two days time to do the assessment? Like if you uh, last time you give one, only one day, that's okay. why I'm asking if you give one more day, full day. Okay, then... one two full days. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we'll do that two full days. Yes, and uh, uh, Pastor, we could also have uh, give us uh, uh, you know till till the end of the day if possible. Uh, mm -hmm. Like something something comes up uh, sometimes during the day. So if it's five o'clock or. I think last time you operated at at, five, at, at uh, six o'clock. Mm -hmm. We have it as uh, you know maybe the end of the day as in eleven eleven fifty nine or something if that's possible. Okay, we'll do that. Okay, so two days and two full whole days. Okay. And is this the final assessment or this is the main? This is the second one. This is the second one. You have two more to go. I've broken it down into chapters. I've given you right. four, so that you can you know if, if you don't do well in one, you can pick up in the other. So. And it also helps you to study, uh, go back, revisit those chapters. Uh, yeah. So please uh, listen. Uh, the uh, the questions will be based also on my notes. Uh, I mean, the lectures that I'm giving you, and uh, not just on the notes. You know, the notes are very uh, little, but I'm giving you a lot of additional information in my lectures. So please listen to the lectures. I hope you're taking down notes, and that would help. Okay, thank you everyone for the joining class. Have a blessed uh, day and a blessed week ahead. God bless you and um, I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you, Kupa. Thank you, Elisha.